You can open your Bibles to Luke 12 if you want to. We're going to continue on the theme of Revelation. I should explain what Revelation, that doesn't mean we're going to look at the last book in the Bible. I'm not there yet. But what it does mean, to, to have Revelation knowledge is to know something supernaturally. And you might say, well, Pastor, I've never known something supernaturally. Now listen to this carefully. If you know that Jesus is the divine Son of God, that was revealed to you. You can Somebody can tell you that, and it just sounds almost dumb. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. And it, you can tell people that, but you know what? It has to be revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? The love of the truth that says when one first comes to you, you have to receive it. Okay, let's look at Luke 12, verse 32. Jesus says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Could we read that in the New Living? The New Living says, don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Father loves to give you the kingdom. The main point of what I want you to see is that he's already given us the kingdom. When we hear that it's given him great joy to give us the kingdom, we think heaven. And thank God, heaven's the most biggest part of it, right? But we have the kingdom now. We have power with God now. We have joy. Let's look at Romans 14, 17. I have a couple of verses here. It says, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. And we're talking about eating food I offer to idols. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice one thing, because I know you know this first. It does not say the kingdom of God will be righteousness, peace, and joy. When is the kingdom of God righteousness? Now. Say right now. You're living in the kingdom now. Amen? Amen. One other verse, Colossians 1.13. For he delivered us from the authority of darkness. Do we have 1.13 down to? For he delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Hallelujah. That's 12. There he is. Read it with me. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Book tense is that? Everybody say past tense. Okay. Now I know this is elementary, but my point is that it gives your father great joy to give you the kingdom now. And we've said this before, so it's not news to any of you. But what I want you to see tonight, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you and then show you the word. There's a lot of different ways that we have more joy today than before we understood who we are in Christ. It is almost impossible to be deathly sick or in great pain and have great joy. True or not? Have you been? Okay. It's almost impossible to watch your home be repossessed and have great joy. Amen? When, okay, so how do we come to a place where we, okay, first of all, back off. I need to show you scripture. Isaiah 51 11 is a picture of how we're supposed to get from here to heaven. It says, so the redeemed or the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. Everlasting joy will be on their heads. They will obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sign will flee away. Hallelujah. Are we the redeemed of the Lord? Okay. Zion is another word for heaven. It says you are come to Mount Zion in Hebrews 12. It's another word for heaven. Okay. It's a place. So the redeemed of the Lord will return and come to with Zion. How? Everybody say with joyful shouting. With everlasting joy, with gladness and joy, and no sorrow or sigh. Now this is a picture of the redeemed on the way to heaven. How are we to travel that way? Question. Are you in favor of that much joy? Okay. Question. Is this the norm for the American people? No. Listen to people talk. Not the norm. We enjoy the highest standard of living of any people who have ever lived on planet Earth, except Adam and Eve. They were the only one that did better than there. I mean, I've been to Europe years ago, and you go through those castles, and you think, oh, we'd like to live in one of those castles. Those castles were dark, dank, and they didn't have indoor plumbing. We live better than anybody, and we still don't have that kind of joy apart from God. How do you get that much? As we started to say, you study the kingdom benefits. Now, a lot of times... We, our thinking is governed by experience instead of by the Word of God. Let me give you an example. 
when I first got filled with the Holy Spirit, I got around people who were talking about divine healing. My head goes tilt, 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 tilt. God doesn't heal today. Now, I have proof positive God didn't heal today because I had been in the church for 19 years and I'd never seen anybody heal. I had never even seen anybody prayed for for healing in 19 years. Therefore, I knew that God did not heal today. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, what was my knowing based on? I was say experience. Yes. Experience. This world right here. Yep. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is knowing things supernaturally. And that doesn't mean that you go around trying to be a guru, but there are certain things about your life you need to know and you need to hear from God. Well, yep. you're getting quiet in here. And you're thinking, well, I know God didn't do that. They caught. No. Let's look at what the Word says. Now, as I said, if you've been chronically ill and in pain, you can get joy into your life by studying this word for faith for help. Yeah. True? Yeah. If you need prosperity, if you'll study it, you'll see how God's finances work. If you get striped out of your home, yeah. your joy level will go right up and off, or way up. And everything we're talking about here is the manifestation of the kingdom of God in your life. Now, I believe that one major factor that affects our joy level that we haven't studied nearly enough now listen to this. We talked about the joy here. One of the major reasons Christians have joy is because we have plenty of light for the journey. Say that, light for the journey. Light, 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 light. What that means is that when you go to God, there, there's another thing I want to say about revelation knowledge. You can see things as a preacher's preaching. If you get under a really good preacher, then you can see things about your life and about the Word of God that you just never saw before. That's revelation. This is the Holy Spirit. And all He does is He's shining light. Revelation just means light, understanding. Yeah. I believe a major factor that affects our joy level is that we haven't studied the fact that we have plenty of light for the journey. Now, here's a thought. How many of you have faith for healing? How did you get faith for healing? Say, I heard the Word of God. I heard the Word of God. And you know what? You didn't hear the word of God about the Antichrist. You heard the word about God about healing, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. How did you get faith for to tithe and know that God was going to make you better off than if you hadn't tithe? Say, I heard the word of God. Okay. How will you get faith for revelation knowledge? Yeah, you got to hear the word of God. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Hallelujah. Now think about this. If tomorrow is brighter than today, if it's more exciting and more blessed. And we knew that, then we would have lived Wednesday in anticipation oh, yeah. of the future. Mm. I was thinking, to, you know, you say, well, that's just fancy talk, fancy talk. <laughs> well, like, hey, let's think about, for how many of you were in the church five years ago? I know some of them you weren't. You knew the church five years ago. Are we in a better place oh, and able to help more people today than five years ago? Yeah. You see, I could... What God wants is for us to be able to look through the eye of faith and see five years from yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Now, what I want to explain is that doesn't mean, when I say that God wants you to be able to look into your future, that doesn't mean that he wants you to see a movie of 2015. And then the whole time you're living 2015, is like a rerun. Wouldn't that be a dud? He doesn't mean that. But what he does mean is for you to look by the eye of faith ahead far enough to have a pretty good sense of where you're going, to know exactly how to get there and what decisions to make now because you have a real good sense of where we're going. Hallelujah. Go to 2 Corinthians 4, please. Another thing I want to read here to you, my notes, and we'll forget. If we do not give the Holy Spirit opportunity to explain things in the Word to us, yeah. how many of you have ever had a time to be quiet with God and He showed you something you had no idea was in the Bible? And you were so excited you just wanted to call somebody and tell them because it's totally, completely new to you. Hallelujah. Everything He shows you is good. He's good. Amen. If you don't give Him opportunity, <laughs> To show you things in the word and to explain things, you will get discouraged and bored and you'll feel stagnant and bogged down. And you wonder why you lost your joy. Because, and this is why. Do you eat every day? Do you eat so how many have you eaten today? Okay. Try not to eat too much, but I've eaten. All right, listen. Your spirit needs to eat. Yeah. And one of the ways you eat is through the word. And it just, you don't want old, dry, stale you know, four-week-old bread. It's not molded, but it's just sitting there. And that, 
and so fresh. Well, the Holy Spirit, you let him get involved in the Bible reading. Yeah. All right, so let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. Paul says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now watch 17. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. How do you think of that? Well, we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. If you can look through the eye of faith at where you're going, even if you're going through a rough time, you know, people who finish school, finish school because they can see the reward beyond the diploma. If you can't, you party. People who live for God powerfully in this age are because they can look right into the next age and know that there is promised great rewards right. there. There's a, we're just in, we're in the beginning of a kingdom that's going to start here and flow right over into to the eternity, okay? Hallelujah. Revelation knowledge gives you light on things that are not apparent on the surface, but that revelation buoys your life up. You know, B-U-O-Y-S, buoys it up, right? Yeah. Yeah. With joy for tomorrow. Paul, we can see in these verses, had the ability to look with the eye of faith. God wants you to live in the light and the insight of his understanding. I was thinking as we were worshiping, sometimes it comes to us as a total revelation how good God has been to us. Even though we have experienced it, we've walked through every bit of it, you can get to where you forget so much of what God has done for you that all of a sudden he shows you, then it's a revelation. Yeah. Let's go to Proverbs 4.18. It says, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. What we're doing here is trying to help you see that if you can glance into the future, your future is always brighter than the past if you're walking in God. Yep. Amen? Yep. Let's look at this in some other translations. I like the message. Look at the message. It's, it says, the ways of right living people glow with light, and the longer they live, the brighter they shine. Isn't that good? Yeah. Okay, let's read it in the New Living. The way of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Now, I don't know if I can get this promise to you, but this is what I saw today. Today is good, but tomorrow is so much better that you've got to be able to take a peek into tomorrow to have enough joy to really get there. You have to live on a supernatural strength level as a Christian, supernatural faith level. And the only way your joy is going to be strong enough to get you where you're going is to be able to live, look at least somewhat in no yeah. The way, the, look at it, it says shines brighter and brighter. One more translation, New King James. But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines brighter, brighter to the perfect day. So the one thing we're convinced of is we're Christians. How many of you know that today's good? How many know that tomorrow's more glorious? Okay. Now, because of this, if I can catch a glimpse of tomorrow, I know it will be more exciting. I'll have plenty of joy to get through whatever I'm going through today. If we're going to walk in the joy of today, and at the same time, okay, excuse me. His goal is for us to be really happy where we are and more excited about where we're going. Are you following me on this? This is good. When Jesus came, now this is when we're finally getting, all we've done here is establish the fact that tomorrow's better, and we need to know about tomorrow. Think about this. When Jesus came, he came to fix a lot of things. Sickness, poverty, curses, but more than anything, he came to alleviate our ignorance. Look at somebody and say, he came to alleviate your ignorance. John 1, go to 1, I can show you this. This is good. How many of you know you understand a lot of things today as a Christian that you didn't have a clue about when you were in darkness? John 1, 5. This is talking about the light coming into the world. It says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. But the alternative reading there is over, overpower it. The darkness did not overpower it. When, uh, you remember what Jesus said to Peter? I was going to read it later, but you know the scripture. He said, who do you say that I am? 
Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you are so blessed. Because no man told you that. You got that straight from God. Yeah. Now, why is it so important to get something straight from God? You should never, ever try to go into the ministry because somebody tells you you're called. <laughs> somebody may confirm to you that you're called to the ministry. But if you're going to go into the ministry, you've got to hear from God. Yeah. And you say, why is that so important? Jesus said, oh, you are so blessed. You know why? Because when, G when Father shows you something, when it's revealed to you, there ain't any flesh and blood on earth that can talk you out of it. Yeah. You know, it's like when I was talking about you guys showing up for extreme when there were only two and it got up a little big and then went down to two and you kept going. You had a revelation that Pastor Gordon couldn't give you and I couldn't give you. You had a revelation from God that God was going to do something here. Now are you following me? A revelation will get you through. I mean, you can be going to Matthew 4.16. The first 15 years that we were here, seriously. It seemed like every friend we had that came to visit us tried to talk us into leaving. And they were not trying to be bad. They knew we were could do, doing too great financially, and they loved us, and they wanted to say, look, you can take this ministry and go to a bigger town, and it'll be a lot easier. We had one person after another try to talk us into going to Fredericksburg, anywhere but here. My goodness, how could you pick this place? But you know why we stay? Tell me. Revelation. Yeah. It had been revealed to us that our destiny was here. When, when, yeah. Okay. Let's read Matthew 4, 16. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, speaking to Jesus. And those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light died. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, a great light came into your life. And you can't receive all the light he has to give at once. But instantly, this is what I like about light. It's so much more powerful than darkness. One time I was over here and all the lights were out. And I don't know what happened if the lights went out while I was here, I think. And it was so dark. But I remembered I had a little tiny flashlight on my keychain. I turned it on. Now this was not something that you could live your whole life by. But even with that little bit of light, I could see the outline of things and I didn't wipe out and break something. Just a little light. If you've only been, say, two months, let me tell you something. You may not have as much light as you'll have 30 years from now, but oh, light is wonderful. Because all of a sudden, where you were wiping out on this and wiping out on that, you've got enough. And the Bible says the way of the just is like the light of the dawn that shines brighter and brighter. I know things about God I didn't know five years ago. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that exciting? So anyhow, when Jesus came, he came to alleviate our, our ignorance. So, if revelation in the word and revelation about our lives is so vital. How do we get faith for revelation? We're going to start looking at some scriptures. John 14. Now, it's extremely important when we read these scriptures that you turn your religious brain off. Did you know that we have some scriptures we've heard so often we think, all oh, right, nice. But we don't believe them. I didn't say you. Okay, hey, I don't. Now look at what it says. Just say right out loud, I believe every word. I believe every word. Exactly the way it's written. Exactly. Then say this, I can hear from God. I can hear from God. Because Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Okay, John 14, verse 21. The Lord is speaking. He said, he who has my commandments and keeps them is one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Okay, so did he promise that he would love us and make himself known to us? Yeah. Yes. I love that line in that one song. Though I have not seen him, my heart knows him well. Jesus yeah. Christ. I love that song. This is so true. Never seen him yet, but oh, we know him so well. Now, the question I wanted to ask you on this verse is, what is our part in positioning ourselves for revelation? If we want the revelation at the end of the verse, what do we have to do at the beginning of the verse? Yeah. I don't care what somebody does, says that's messing around, living like the devil, and they talk about knowing God. Yeah, you may know him, but you don't know him too well. You, don't. you know why? Because there's a price to pay for knowing God. The price is simple. It's obedience. So, if we're going to position ourselves for a revelation, our part is to obey. Look at verse 23. 
Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. How does the, the father, how does the father decide how much you love him? Yeah, how much you obey him? If you obey him, you know he knows you love him. And then what happens? And my father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our vote with him. So the first thing you do, how many just want to know the presence of God? We're, we're back to where we were two weeks ago when we showed the commercial, Brother Copeland, with him. Because the Holy Spirit walks with you just like that. And it's possible to become so sensitive that you're aware. And it's not like he's talking to you all the time, but when you need to hear from God, he'll speak right up. Any of you ever been about to make a mistake and you knew something inside you said, uh-uh, thank God. So verse 23 says, Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. The first step, everybody listen to this, the first step of experiencing that verse is to say, I believe it. I believe that when I opened my life to him, the father and Jesus came the very next, right? Yeah. And it's good to confess that, okay? Now, look at verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Now, there's one thing that that verse presupposes, and that is, listen to this, that you have read. Uh, you see, when Jesus was talking to these uh, 11 guys, Judas had already left. He was talking to 11 guys who had lived with him and listened to him carefully for three and a half years. So if the Holy Spirit is going to remind you at the right time of the verse you need, you're going to have to put time putting it in there. Right? But look at the other thing. He says he will teach you all things. I honestly believe that if you're willing to be taught, okay, first off, you learn to be led of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Dad Hagen said something that came to me as we were worshiping. And he always said this. He said, I go as much by what he doesn't say as by what he does say. Mm. And what does that mean? If he's told you to be a part of the church, yeah. you stay in that church until he says otherwise. That's okay? Right. If he puts you on a course, you assume that, that you just keep going until he tells you otherwise. Right. Yeah. I, I gave you an example when God spoke to me extremely forcefully once because I was off. And I thought I was on. I thought my dad should stay in New England. And he ended up, it was God's will that he'd come down to Regents University. And I said, I don't like this talk about him leaving New England. I said to the store, I was, I was a lot cockier than you may think I'm feisty now. And I said that to the Lord. And the Lord said, well, you better get over it because he's going. And it was so abrupt and so jolting. And from that point, I never prayed about his leaving New England or asked God because I really wanted to. I thought we were called to New England. God, will, I'm saying that if you want to do the will of God and you will develop your heart in sensitivity, he will always in his grace. If you give him permission, this is what Brother Copeland said. He said, I gave the Lord permission many years ago. When I'm going to make a big mistake, please stop me. Yeah. Yeah, that's, good. that's a really good thing because it puts you in the mode of being correctable, even though none of us are 100% correctable 100% of the time. I'm sorry to say that. How many of you know sometimes you're more sensitive to the Holy Ghost than you are to others, right? We all try to stay there, but there's something about going before God and saying, honestly, if I'm messing up and I'm wrong in what I'm believing, let me know. And what that did by him telling me that, I didn't try to argue with my father to sway. I would have really come against the will of God in somebody's life. Okay, let's look at John 16, 13. Jesus said, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on his own initiative, but what he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Could we read that in New Living too? When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, and he will not speak on his own, but he'll only tell you what he's heard. He will tell you about the future. Now, you say, well, how many things about the future am I supposed to be able to hear? I, this is what I believe, okay? I believe he will show you everything you need to know. And everything, 
When God shows you something in your future and it's something his heart and his will, let's suppose it's free to own your own home. Okay, I'm just using this as an example. I'm, I believe that owning your own home is not the American dream. I believe that owning the own home is God's dream. Read Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 11, it says, when I bring you into your promised land, I'll give you days of heaven on earth. Well, I'm, that's pretty, pretty good. He not only said to them, you'll own your own home, he said, you'll own homes full of um, houses full of things that you didn't even fill. Yeah. I have a cousin who experienced that. I mean, it was sort of not how it happened, but in, she bought a home. And when they walked in, the family had gone down on a plane, which, you know, you never quite pray for this. But God gave her a home full of everything that she could ever want. Now, I don't think that's usually the way God does it, all right? Come on. But I believe that he wants you with a home full of good things. Yeah. Okay. Okay, here's my point. Let's suppose that God holds that before you and he witnesses to your heart. Maybe it's the right spouse or maybe it's a home of your own. All of a sudden, you get excited. Yes? Yeah. And when that happens, a couple of things happen. Number one, God has your complete undivided attention for a few months. You know what I'm saying? God is an enormously good teacher. When I taught, I do just about anything to keep their attention on those other problems, okay? You have to have their attention, or you're not going to teach them anything. Yeah. No. God doesn't want bad things to hold your attention. He doesn't want a car wreck to happen to you so he can gain your attention. He wants a faith promise to get your attention. Follow me? Okay? Yeah. So a couple of things happen. Number one, by the way, I think you can realize God wants me to own my own home. Number two, it's amazing the incentive obedience has when you realize who the rewarder is. I mean, come on. How many of you realize that God is the rewarder? And all of a sudden, you just start living better. Number three, you have hope. You think, well, I'm not crazy about where I'm living, but praise God. Is that exciting? I'm trying to get you to see God likes to show you things. Maybe not everything, but he likes. Oh, man, you can't use that. It's the Jew, Willie George. You may know who Willie George was with gospel, but he was never afraid to use this analogy. Dangling a carrot. He says, I've had people tell me it's wrong to give your kids an allowance if they do certain things. He says, that's the way God works. If you will follow God and use your faith, he will reward you. Amen. Amen. So how does God do? You get in prayer and you see the word and you see God wants us to own our own home. How is that? You put your faith out. You come to agreement in Matthew 18 with your spouse. It says, if any two of you owners will agree touching anything that they ask. Okay? Now the scripture is in 1 John 3. It says, if you'll ask anything according to his will, find out where it's his will. And you agree. Then you, by faith, you believe you receive. Mark, Mark 11, 24. When you pray, believe you receive. Now from that point on, you see it as done and accomplished in the spirit. What happens, you've got to get from point A to point B, being a good, happy camper, thanking God, not, yeah. you know, griping about the place you're living in. There is something about having God reveal the future to you. That, yeah. Okay. Hallelujah. Now, as I said, I'm going to wrap this up, but it says, when it says that he'll tell you about the future, that does not mean that you're going to watch 2020. Or, you know, 2019, like, a, and then live a rerun. Wouldn't that be boring? You're not going to tell you so much it's not exciting. Don't worry about that. But it does mean you should know enough about your future to make wise decisions, uh -huh. to prepare in cooperation with the future. And the Holy Spirit is a spirit of revelation. And what, like it says, when it says, those who sat in darkness saw a great light. Right? He came to alleviate our ignorance. We're ignorant about almost all things in the Spirit. He came to show you how the Father likes to be treated. Isn't that nice? He said, oh, you're not excited about that. There's this proverb that says, he who cares for his master will be honored. Did you know that? Well, how do you care? Who's your master? The one who sits on the throne. I wonder how I could bless him today. If I bless him and care for him, I will be honored. Are you following it? The Holy Spirit came to teach you. Now, at the moment, I'm a happy person. You say, why is that, Pastor? you like to be in front of people? No, I don't really like to be in front of people at all. But I am a teacher. I couldn't help it. I was born that way. Have any other teachers in here when you're a teacher? 
There is nothing. I remember the very first year that we were here, we had something called Off We Go and Sing Spell Reading Right. What was the second one? I can't remember. Anyhow, it was teaching phonetic reading because they weren't teaching it in schools at that time. It was a long time, almost 30 years ago. So at any rate, we were teaching a Head Start program and we were teaching them the letters and then all of a sudden they would get it and they'd start and twinkles, there'd be flashbulbs as they started to learn to read. It was the most exciting day when they finally got it. And I would just be jumping up. I am not called to teach elementary school for anything in the world. I'm bad. I would even when I was teaching worship warriors, some of y'all, I would just, if, if, you, if you got me worship warriors, I was fine. But when I got in with a little praise verse, I'd say, please, grow up so I can teach you something. I got what you're driving me nuts, okay? At the moment, I'm happy. I was called a teacher. When I saw those kids learn to read, it would make my whole day help. Because, now listen, the Holy Spirit who lives inside you is yeah. a teacher. Yeah. Jesus said, when the teacher comes. Yeah. You want to, you know, they call Jesus that all the time. They say, teacher, uh -huh. you don't ever have to motivate him to teach. Yeah. Christiana knows that I do not have to be motivated to teach. Her grandfather also is a teacher. I'll say, you know who knows about that? Grandpa. And she said, oh, I don't have time for that. <laughs> now, she loves her grandfather, but he knows so much on a subject, particularly if it pertains to Israel or the Word of God. If she calls him up, she better be ready for 30 to 45 minutes. And it'll be good teaching, but it's more than she wants, okay? She doesn't ask me something about the Word unless she really wants to. And I try not to overdo. I honestly do. But if I've seen something, I feel obligated to share it to you because I'm a teacher. Now, listen. The Holy Spirit who lives within you yeah. loves to teach. The question is not whether he loves to teach, but whether you love to be taught. Yeah. Being taught by the Holy Spirit brings great joy for two reasons. I think it's exciting. I don't know if you think. To me, this is the most exciting thing in the world. It's more exciting than healing. I'm already healed. It's more exciting than prosperity. I've got my bills paid and I don't love money. I'm like, to me, the prospect of learning more about God and knowing how the future goes and, and getting there. It's the most exciting thing in the world. Two reasons it's good to be taught by him. Number one, he always teaches you how to make your life better. He always enhances your life. Look, I know you, we've looked at this a lot, but Isaiah 48, is, look at, he always teaches you. And in your husband-wife relationship, if he's leading you to treat your wife better, it's because he wants you to have better life. If, if he's teaching, ladies, if he's showing you how to treat your husband better, it's because he loves you. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you, your prophet, who leads you in the way you should go. If only you would pay attention to my commandments. Next verse. Hallelujah. Then your well-being, your shalom, would have been like a river. Now, I know we've been talking about this on Sunday. Your righteousness like the waves of the sea. But if you're not willing to be taught... You will go through one bad relationship after another, after another, until you come to the end of your life and you don't have any friends. Because you have to let the Lord... Yep. How many of you know that the Lord will teach you how to be a good friend? Yep. Will. Okay. Now think about this. The Holy Spirit's role... we got five more minutes and then we're praying. The Holy Spirit's role in Revelation is so vital that he even prayed. Paul prayed in Ephesians 1. I want to show you at least two more scriptures that we'll just pick up. In Ephesians chapter 1, look at what Paul prayed for the church. He said, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith of the Lord Jesus that exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Let's just stop there. Now look, Kenneth Hagin, we hear Dad Hagin teach on the books that are where he taught before he left. We think he always knew those things. He didn't. When he first started out being a pastor, he was in a denominational church. Okay, you say, well, what kinds of things do they do wrong? For one thing, they would tell people that you had to tarry for the Holy Spirit. And then when the Holy Spirit just came on you real strong, you started speaking in tongues. Well, that's not scriptural, but that's how they did. Right. They, so he would routinely, once he started tra traveling ministry, 
have people that come forward that have been tearing for 12 years, 18 years that have been tearing. Well, tearing isn't what he said. The only people he told to tarry were the first group because the Holy Spirit had not come yet. Come on. Once the Holy Spirit came, they always received instantly the moment they prayed. Yeah. So anyhow, early on in the ministry, he was looking at what he was doing. He says, Lord, this isn't scriptural. He says, what am I going to do? And the Lord directed him to this prayer. And every day for six months, at least three times a day, he prayed. He said, oh, Father, give me a spirit of wisdom and a revelation and the knowledge of you. Open the eyes of my heart so that I may know what is the surpassing greatness of your power. Okay. And he prayed that prayer. And it revolutionized his ministry because all of us have certain parts of our thinking that are simply the traditions of men. Now don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. I didn't say some of you were not me. Me. I. Okay. For six months, he prayed that prayer. It revolutionized his life and ministry so much that when he came up against a particularly hard case, like his brother, Doug, he always talked about Doug, his brother. I mean, he was off. It was during the Depression. He lived many years ago. And this guy would ride the trains. He was so far from God. Finally, he said, now, Father, if you could give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation, then I, you can give Doug one. He prayed that for six weeks, and his brother got saved. It's a wonderful way to pray for people. Because if they could just get the eyes of their heart. Now, if he could have his whole life and ministry revolutionized by one prayer, yeah. you and I need to pray that prayer. Yeah. God, give me that, give me the place where I can hear from you. Give me a spirit of wisdom. Yeah. There's one other day place. I know I gotta stop. But stop right now. Normally I hit things and then just keep going. <laughs> Do you know that if we continue to teach on this for another three months, we'll probably go that long, but on Wednesday nights, that our faith for hearing from God, our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit would greatly increase. If, here's a question, if our sensitivity to the leading of God increased, would our lives be enhanced or go downhill? Greatly. All he wants to do is enhance our lives. Now, if the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to those three things, uh, what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of your glories? Your faith can do anything. Do you see what I'm saying? Your faith would be. Okay. Last scripture. I want to show you. We'll stop here. Do you understand that even Jesus had this exact same spirit on him? Paul said, I pray that he would give you a spirit of wisdom and you soon show me. It's in Isaiah 11, the prophesying of the Messiah. Don't you love seeing things in the Word of God that you never really saw before? Yes. I want you to say this with me. Once the Lord reveals something to me, reveals something nobody can ever take it away. Nobody can ever take it away. Now this is, we know it is speaking of Jesus, because look at the first verse. That a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. We know that's Jesus, because in Revelation he calls himself the, the root and the offspring of David. Verse 2. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see or make a decision by what his ears hear. That was prophesied of the Messiah. Yeah, there's one thing you really need to understand about Jesus. When Satan said to him, Oh, if you're really the son of God, prove it. He had to take by faith that he was the son of God. He laid aside everything. As that little baby, he doesn't bore knowing he was the son of God. He had to see it in the scriptures and take it by faith. He had to confess the word just like you and I, I do. He found that scripture and said, oh, the spirit of the Lord rests upon me, the spirit of wisdom. Yeah. Now, I, and you say, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, first of all, you understand that you were predestined to become conformed to the image of Jesus. Just the way he operated, we're supposed to operate. Sure. Okay, and I'll tell you last story. When I, when I first got filled with the Holy Spirit, I was known for being extremely daffy. Now, by that, I know you don't, but I, I got really good grades. You give me a test, I can face it. On paper, I look good. But when it came to everyday life, I was and finally, when I get in the Word, I think, you know, that's not, I couldn't lose my keys all the time. I, you know what I'm saying? I've never met somebody that's just too daffy that they were always causing problems for other people. Then it was, okay. 
The Lord told me to start to invest in this. And he said, this is embarrassing. Yeah, it's embarrassing that I'm telling you what you would want your pastor never to have confessed the scripture. Come on. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? No. Verse 2. Look at the guy. Verse 2. Two. It says, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Me. Denise Gaudier back then. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and strength. The Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. If you'll confess that, you won't want to do evil real fast. The fear of the Lord is on you. Yeah. And I delight in the fear of the Lord. Go to the next verse if you would. I delight in the fear of the Lord. Yeah. I do not make a, ju a judgment by what my eyes see or a decision by what my ears hear. I decide everything. And you see, yeah. you think, well, you're being melodramatic. It wasn't melodramatic back then. No. I didn't decide, decide anything. I didn't decide if I was healed by the word of God. I didn't decide if I loved you by the word of God. I decided whether I liked you or not. And I, I began to say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I delight the fear of the Lord. I judge, but I don't judge by what I see. I judge by this word. And I went, I still could be deaf. I've been known to lose my keys. But listen, it's not a continual, are you, you can't afford to make a lot of bad decisions in life. All of us make a few. You can't afford to go around. What happens when you... Am I gone too long? No, but listen, do you understand? You, we can increase yeah. in the wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. Right. Yeah. And, and you say, why are you making a big deal on this? Because this is the easiest... I love freebies. Anybody yeah. else love freebies? Yeah. This doesn't cost you anything but a 3 by 5 card. If you don't have one, I've got in my office. I'll hand you one. What do you do on one side? You put verse... I'm just really serious about this. Because, you see, the word is alive. Yeah. And instead of you trying to say, I will not be daffy, I will not be daffy, I am not a blonde, I will not act like a blonde, you know? It, I had tried that. I had tried to be sensible, practical, and have common sense. I didn't have any. All I did was look good on tests. This is alive. Yeah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. And I delight in the fear of the Lord. I do not... And all of a sudden... Instead of me making that happen, I gave a place for the word to become rooted in me to change me. If you want to hear from God, you, you have to say, thank God I hear from you. Uh, yeah. Amen? Okay, we all have medicine and everything, but it's a place to think about this week. Amen? Hallelujah. Can I say one last thing about the lesson? Why don't you go? Yeah. One thing I forgot to say. If you want to be sensitive to the spirit, I love for freebies. Okay, one is just confess it. Scripture. Praying in tongues. I don't understand it completely. But listen, praying in the Holy Spirit will make you sensitive spiritually in a way nothing else can. It is the gateway to supernatural. So if you really want to know the Lord better, and do pray in the Spirit. I should say. Yeah. Okay.